Good morning, my name is Christian Gray Stevens. Thank you for letting me present our study from the Royal Cornwall Hospital that looks at the difference between dual mobility and standard total hip replacements in the treatment of hip fracture. We have no conflicts of interest to declare. In otherwise fit and healthy patients, NICE guidance suggests that displaced intracapsular neck of femur fractures should be treated with total hip arthroplasty. However, there have been concerns raised about total hip replacement in this cohort. For example, the health study published in 2019 noted limited functional benefit of hip replacement in this cohort with a dislocation risk of 4.7% compared to 2.4% with hemiarthroplasty. As a strategy to mitigate instability in at-risk hip patients, dual mobility implants have found increasing favour. However, studies examining their effectiveness for management of hip fracture remain sparse and generally are of lower quality. We set out to compare the performance of standard hip replacement with dual mobility hip replacements in hip fracture patients. We sought to do this using retrospective data and undertaking a case matched comparison. Our primary outcome was Oxford hip score. This was powered to recruit a minimum of 52 patients in each arm. Secondary outcome measures were dislocation rate and return to theatre for any cause. Utilising our local national hip fracture data, we reviewed all hip replacements operations between 2012 and 2018. Following data cleaning, we were left with 62 pairs of patients that we were able to match. We matched patients for source of admission, mobility status, gender, age, ASA and AMTS. P-values showed overall no difference between the two groups. In addition, all patients were required to have had a posterior approach and all standard total hip arthroplasty patients had a 32 mil head. There was no difference in Oxford hip score between standard and dual mobility total hip arthroplasty. There were four dislocations in the standard total hip arthroplasty group with zero dislocations in the dual mobility group. This represents a 6.5% risk of dislocation in the standard cohort. Of the four dislocations, one was a single episode treated with relocation and three were recurrent requiring revision surgery. There was one periprosthetic fracture in the standard group and two in the dual mobility group. There was one deep infection in the dual mobility group, none in the standard group. Our study indicates that dual mobility total hip arthroplasty offers functional equivalent to standard total hip arthroplasty. We noted a trend towards fewer dislocations. However, it is important to note that our study was not powered to look at this. In our trust, the dual mobility component costs £128 more than a standard total hip arthroplasty. However, the cost of dislocation may easily outweigh this. With a cost of approximately £3,000 for each admission for dislocation and £17,000 for each revision surgery, a very rough calculation indicates the £8,000 extra spent on the dual mobility implants in our 62 patients is easily outweighed by the £72,000 spent dealing with instability in the standard group. This question was looked at in 2016 by Costa and Griffin's Oxford Group as part of a pilot study for the White 2 trial. Interestingly, they found that recruiting to such a trial would be too difficult. Using a McNamara sample size calculator, allowing for 20% dropout to show a difference in between 1% and 5% dislocation rates in the two groups, we would need 175 patients in each arm. We suggest a randomized control trial could potentially complete this regionally within a few years. What are the group's thoughts? Thank you very much. Are there any questions?